Ever ordered groceries with Instacart? They're about to make another big delivery, one of the most anticipated IPOs of the year. That's right. Today, we are diving into the grocery delivery giant. But we're not just tossing avocados and milk into our virtual cart. We are dissecting the S1 filing they just released. If you're scratching your head wondering, what is an S1? Well, don't worry. Think of it as a company's tell-all autobiography before it hits the big stage of public trading. It's packed with juicy details from secret sauces to skeletons in the closet. We spent hours reviewing this document so you don't have to. Together in the next 15 minutes, we're about to uncover Instacart's history, its business model, financials, spotlight key risks, the management team, and its growth strategy. And we'll even give you our take on the company as an investment. So whether you're an investing pro or just curious about the behind the scenes of this grocery tech giant, we've got a lot to cover. So let's get into it. Hey there, it's Stephanie, tech veteran, engineer, and creator. And I'm Bertrand, founder of App Economy Insights. Instacart was born in 2012. It was the brainchild of Apoorva Mehta, a former Amazon employee. He didn't set out to reinvent grocery shopping initially. In fact, his journey began with 20 other failed startups before landing on Instacart. It's a testament to the power of perseverance in the entrepreneurial world. In just a few years, Instacart transitioned from a fledgling startup in San Francisco to a nationwide phenomenon, changing the way millions shop for their groceries. They expanded across the United States and Canada. It made several key acquisitions like Unata, now known as Storefront Pro, an e-commerce solution for retailers. At its core, Instacart's mission has always been clear, delivering the future of grocery. It's a promise that reflects not just in its tech, but in its effort to continuously expand, ensuring more folks get groceries delivered straight to their doorstep. In the realm of grocery delivery, Instacart's prominence is hard to miss. While there are other players in the field, Instacart partners with over 1,400 retailers that make more than 85% of the U.S. grocery market. The company revealed 7.7 .7 million monthly active orderers. They spent $317 per month on average. I don't know about you, but I don't use grocery delivery at all. I mean, I do use, you know, Amazon to buy some items in bulk, but mostly packaged goods. Uh, and you know, I'm a big Trader Joe's guy, so they are not on Instacart, unfortunately. Right, but I can see the potential for grocery delivery in America because even I have exclusively started to buy home goods online. And if it weren't for the fact that my fiance loves grocery shopping in person, I hate it. I would be the next candidate for Instacart. So let's talk about the business model. Just like Uber relies on its drivers to function, Instacart relies on its shoppers. They are considered contractors under California's Prop 22, but things could change over time. Okay, so how does Instacart make money? First, we have the gross transaction value or GTV for short. That's the value spent on Instacart for the product sold inclusive of taxes, all fees and tips. Think of GTV as the total bill at a restaurant, including the meal, taxes and service. This chart shows the GTV since Instacart was founded. You can see the massive bump caused by the pandemic, but GTV continued to grow from a new elevated base ever since. All right, now let's look at the unit economics of a single order on Instacart. We assume here an average order value of $110. Instacart only keeps the fees it collects from customers and from retailers. It's called the transaction revenue. That's about $7 compared to the $110 spent on the order net of incentives. The retailer fee is usually a percentage of the order, but it can also be a negotiated flat fee. Meanwhile, the customer fee includes the delivery and service fee. And it also includes a flat fee from Instacart Plus, which is a membership program for unlimited free deliveries for large orders. So critically, Instacart's transaction revenue is already net of all customer incentives and shopper earnings. It's what is left for the company from the transaction after everyone else gets paid. Next, we have advertising revenue, which includes per-click ads and flat fees to be featured on Instacart's platform. All right, before we dive into Instacart's financials that they revealed for the very first time, be sure to hit that subscribe button so we can keep bringing you content and help you on your tech, business, and investing journey. 
Now let's switch gears to the company's income statement. The most recent period shared in the S1 was the first half of 2023. Now it's important to note that the GTB only grew 4% year over year with relatively flat orders for the period. So why? Well, because the first half of 2022 was impacted by a new COVID variant combined with government stimulus. And while it boosted orders, it also came with shopper incentives to keep up with the demand, which lowered Instacart's revenue. While orders were flat, transaction revenue actually grew 34% year over year, boosted by fewer incentives to shoppers and customers. Advertising and other revenue grew 24% year over year. 97% of the revenue comes from the US and the other 3% Canada. Instacart has a high gross margin at 75%. The cost of revenue includes payment processing fees, hosting, insurance and fulfillment costs. Note that it's a much higher gross margin than Uber, for example. A factor is that orders are about $113 on average. So the payment processing fees make a much smaller portion of the cost compared to Uber, which often sees rides for less than 20 bucks. A key takeaway from the S1 is that Instacart is a profitable company that might surprise some of you. After spending 22% of revenue on sales and marketing, the organization is pretty lean, leading to an 18% operating margin. The company is cash flow positive, has nearly 2 billion in cash and short-term investments, and no long-term debt. So it's a pretty stellar balance sheet. So what are the things that keep Instacart up at night? Well, first we have growth expectations. Instacart grew its GTV at a compound annual growth rate of 80% between 2018 and 2022, but it was artificially boosted by the pandemic and the expected future growth will greatly affect the valuation. If the company fails to meet expectations, the stock price will likely suffer. Next, we have competition, the elephant in the room. The grocery delivery space is saturated with players, both old and new. Some of these competitors are also partners, making it a delicate balance for Instacart to maintain. The long list includes Amazon, brick and mortar retailers with their own digital offerings like Walmart or Target, Dashmart from DoorDash, Uber Eats, Fresh Direct, Getir, GoPuff, the list goes on. According to the order value from Yipit data, Instacart had roughly 75% market share for orders over $75, which makes three quarters of its revenue. The market share is closer to 50% for orders below $75. And it shows that Instacart is used on a recurring basis as part of a deliberate lifestyle routine, as opposed to an impulse or last minute order. These are people who are using Instacart to buy their week's worth of groceries. Next, we have regulations from privacy to data security and rules for gig economy workers might evolve. Instacart may face additional compliance costs and potential lawsuits. It's essential to understand these risks when considering Instacart's journey forward. But remember, every company, no matter how successful, faces its set of challenges. It's how they navigate them that truly defines their trajectory. Now let's talk about management and the board of directors. Fiji Simo joined as CEO in August 2021. She was previously head of the Facebook app, the flagship product at Meta. She's also on the board of directors at Shopify. Like me, she got her master's from HEC Paris, so I'm rooting for her. On the board, we also have founder Apoorva Meta, New York Times CEO Meredith Kapit Levian, Snowflake CEO Frank Slootman, and former Sequoia partner Michael Moritz and many more. This is an impressive roster of high-profile executives, and it could guide Instacart to new heights. So far, Instacart has raised 3 billion since 2012, over 19 rounds, according to Crunchbase. In early 2021, the company raised $265 million, and around that included Andreessen Horowitz, Sequoia Capital, and D1 Capital Partners. So we learned from the S1 that PepsiCo has agreed to invest $175 million in Instacart in a private placement concurrent to the IPO. Note that in December 2022, Instacart slashed its internal valuation to $10 billion. That's 74% less than the $39 billion price tag in its 2020 funding round. So the big question, what are they gonna do with the money raised with the IPO? Primarily to settle the tax bills tied to the stock rewards that they've been generously showering their execs and staff. And after that, if there's anything left over, 
then they'll use it towards operations or potential acquisitions. Instacart's growth has been mostly organic until 2021. And since then, after achieving improvement in unit economics, they have significantly increased their marketing spend. One thing I love doing with digital businesses is looking at past cohorts of customers to see if we can extrapolate trends. Something to highlight here is that the 2019 cohort has expanded steadily in the past four years. However, the 2020 cohort was boosted by the pandemic and has declined slightly. While the pandemic helped establish the business with greater scale and gross margin, management doesn't expect the accelerated growth to recur in the future. That said, the overall trend is healthy and shows increased usage over time for all other cohorts, with spending doubling by year three and nearly tripling by year five. If we think long-term, the growth comes down to the company's competitive advantages. That includes things like network effects around its two-sided marketplace, like more grocery store options bringing in more members and vice versa. It's strong branding, the trove of data it collects. Its flexible workforce allows for scalability and its partnerships. Now management believes the opportunity ahead is significant. Up to $1.1 trillion with groceries in the U.S. expected to continue to shift online. According to Incisive, only 12% of grocery sales are online today well below other categories. Management also mentioned AI and machine learning, including features based on large language models. So we don't give investment advice on this channel, but I can share with you a golden rule I apply to all my investments in public equities. First of all, there is a popular saying on Wall Street, IPO means initial public offering, but it also means it's probably overpriced. I think it was coined by Ken Fisher. Well, the data seems to confirm that. Bill McIntosh of the Nasdaq Economic Research found that three years after going public, almost two thirds of IPOs between 2010 and 2020 underperformed the S&P 500 by more than 10%. It's in the underwriter's interest to make sure the shares trade at the highest price. So. There's rarely a reason to rush in. I don't invest in brand new IPOs during the first six months. Why? Shares tend to underperform out of the gate for new public companies and often bottom around the tail end of the lockup period as selling pressure comes from the insiders. It's also critical to gain insights from the first few quarters to form an opinion about the management team. Do they forecast conservatively? Do they consistently beat their own guidance? If not, it might be a sign that they are running out of steam and may have embellished their prospects in the S1. But we need several quarters to really get a sense of the dynamic at play. Well, what do you think? Will you invest in Instacart in the coming months? Or is there another up and coming IPO that you have your eye on? Share with us in the comments below. Instacart is not the only marketplace out there. So check out our review of how Airbnb makes money and the key performance indicators to track in this next video. So see you there.